we are supposed to be we're supposed to be the country of many many intellectuals and musicians and uh, and writers and philosophers right and we kind of owe to our past to a bit of seriousness <laughs> How else, how's it going, man? Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. All the way. You are an academic. You are a translator and an Italian anglicist. Yeah. What I does do. that mean? It means that I'm supposed to, to, to teach um, and study English literature. Uh, literature is in English, in, in English language. Mm -hmm. But I'm mostly into Irish literature in English. Right. So what, what they call Anglo-Irish literature sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's like Joyce and Oscar Wilde, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. yeah, you translated a very uh, simple book, right? The yeah, Ulysses by James Joyce, very uh, light. Oh, yeah, 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 that, that was the easy one. <laughs> no, I was. I thought you referred to Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake, yeah, right. The last one, which is slightly more difficult than Ulysses. Ulysses is, is a complex enough book, but it's very easy compared, compared to Finnegan's Wake. At okay. least it is readable in a kind of traditional way. Mm -hmm. whereas Finnegan's Wake is just a, a new language, and you can read it in whichever way you want. It's a very right. strange book. So, why would you do something like that to yourself? Because other people don't do it. I mean, other people don't want to, <laughs> to take up these projects. So, every time there is a difficult book, publishers ask around, nobody wants to do things, so they call Terrinoni. At the end, I, I end okay. up doing these things. And uh, I waste my, a lot of my, my, my time doing these things. Mm -hmm. But I mean, seriously, no, they're, they're great books. But um, it, it takes not just time, but also a lot of, many, many years of study to be able to you know, approach those books from a linguistic point of view right so not too many people actually nowadays do the kind of thing in, in italy but also in other countries i mean finnegan's wake has been translated only in eight languages in the world mm -hmm. they did the, the, the whole book right so there's a bunch of people working on it in the world you know it's a bunch of masochists i guess mm. so how did uh, your love for ireland come from like what what what, what did it start it's I I think it's the Pogues. You know the Pogues. The, the, the Pogues, yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's them because okay. many many years ago, uh, 1994 or something, I was very very fond of of them. Shane McGowan. Hmm. So I started going to Ireland every every other day, basically. And whenever I had some money, I would buy a, a ticket and go up to Ireland. And then from 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 the music, I discovered the Guinness, and then I discovered the the literature of Ireland, and I became involved more in the literature. Actually, I tried to do the music a bit. Really. At the very beginning, okay. yeah, I used to play in pubs here in Rome, mm -hmm. and then up in Ireland, I joined this band called the North Siders. Mm. But cider was spelled with this with a C, like the, the cider, you right? Know? <laughs> so, uh, and we, they would they would do Republican ballads, Irish Republican ballads. Uh -huh. I was just doing the guitar, um, but then I was not a great musician, so literature mm. was probably easy, the easiest way, you know. Right. Yeah. So, how did you? What, at what age did you um, get into literature? Like, I suppose there was like a whole path starting to study literature i suppose literature and philosophy very often comes together yeah yeah i'd say after high school i am um, i mean i was always a reader mm. but i uh, i didn't see myself as a person that would become a professor of literature right uh, at that age because i was as i said i was m much more interested in music but then i mm. realized that i was not as good enough to to become a musician so i guess i did my university degree here in italy and then i did my masters and my phd and uh, mm -hmm. postdocs all in ireland right uh, and i was studying irish literature mainly so i'd say from 18 19 i, re I realized that i was going to do this because you know when you when you start liking something like hey um it's very difficult to to do some anything else mm -hmm. uh, i mean a lot of people do things that they don't like but i never been such a person i i, I prefer doing things that i like right so i i started reading irish literature i started in this guy called brendan behan mm -hmm. who was an ira um volunteer i mean he described himself as the most captured irish soldier in the world because he was not great okay. great soldier but he was also a, a drunkard and a, a literary man a guy that wrote uh, great books and the first book that I translated was one of his books okay. entitled Confessions of an Irish Rebel. Hmm. It's a great book. So after that, there was no way way back. You know, you don't, I, I couldn't go back to music. I couldn't go back to Italy. <laughs> and, uh, I lived in Ireland for a few years and then I, uh, I just got caught up. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get about translating a book? I mean, somebody comes up to you and says, here's my book, translate it. I, I mean, mean, that people t tend not to do this. I mean, Joyce <laughs> couldn't ask me because he was... But uh, no, normally what you do, there are two ways about. There are people that um, 
that are just professional translators and they are asked by 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 publishers mm -hmm. do you want to do this you want to do that and other people like me who are uh, experts in, in specific authors who right. propose make their own proposals to publishers okay so most of, of the books that i did was my idea so i asked the publisher do you would you like this book to be in your catalog but uh, some sometimes like ulysses i didn't choose it was I was contacted by a publisher okay. who was looking for uh, some young translator who could be paid less, of course, because mm. young translators got very little pay. Um, and they were looking also for somebody who was uh, into Irish literature because the thing with Joyce in Italy is that for many, many years he was considered kind of a British or an English writer, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, they all knew that he was from Ireland, but uh, translators of Joyce were not experts in uh, Irish English, in the language, right. in the English that is spoken in Ireland. So this new publisher uh, realized that he needed to change this view. So he needed a young translator, an expert on Joyce, but also an expert on Ireland. Mm -hmm. So they asked me, do you, do you want to do Ulysses? And at the very beginning, I thought it was a joke, because I was in America back then, and I received an email, like two lines, Dear Professor, do you want to translate Ulysses? And I thought it was like, the usual joke by right. one of my drunk friends. <laughs> so I didn't reply for three or four days. Then I received the second email and I actually checked mm -hmm. and, I, and it was it was real. So I did that. And uh, so that, that was probably the only proposal that was made to me for a book. The rest mm -hmm. of them, I, I asked publishers if they wanted them. And like, do you use any system to go through the whole thing? I mean, it's probably sequential from the beginning to the end, but uh, maybe also not. Maybe you have some specific system. Uh, you know what? Like with with Finnegan's Wake, we didn't we didn't uh, it's not, not just myself myself and another guy Fabio Tra Fabio Pedone, mm -hmm. we co-translated the book and we didn't uh, begin from the beginning, mm. but for a simple reason that we took up the job from another guy who had died in the meantime. Oops. So basically, the the <laughs> predecessor had died at the end of book two of Finnegan's Wake, mm. and we started uh, from the beginning of book three. So this was strange, but not too strange because. Finnegan's Wake is a book with no beginning and no end. Okay. I mean, it begins with a with a word without capital letter, and it ends with the article the. Mm. So it's kind of a circular book. So we began from the middle, but it's one of the many beginnings. But normally, yes, what you do is you read the book first if you like it. I mean, mm -hmm. then you you need to like. A lot of people, as I said, translate books they don't they don't like, and they they um, the outcome is never too too good. Because when you don't like something, you know it's gonna be it's gonna be bad. It's like playing a type of music that you don't like. You know it's right. gonna be it's gonna be bad. So yes, I uh, I only do the books that I really like. Mm. And uh, but then when you no know, when you translate, you start from the beginning and and you finish with the end. But when you do the revisions or rereading, editing, then there is no sequentiality. Mm. It, it, you can basically basically start from wherever. And do you then kind of write down a first draft and just write the things down as they come to you and then start working from there? Or what's the process in the whole thing? Because yeah. I suppose you will not put everything, or maybe you do, I don't know, into Google Translator and then start copying it out there now and then uh, yeah. from there start editing and modifying. It's how I did <laughs> many translations, but not books, of, books, of course. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess no, that, that wouldn't be done in the professional world of translators. Because there, when you when you hand in a book to to the publisher, mm -hmm. then the, the the book gets redone by a lot of other people, checked and edited right. and re revised. Uh, so the biggest the publisher, the many the more people you have working on the same book. So you basically do the first draft and the second draft, maybe and the third draft sometimes. Mm -hmm. And after that, there is the Italian editor, then there is the revisers, the copy editors. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know check the books you couldn't, you couldn't work right. with google translate too much <laughs> but uh, yeah well what, what i do is normally do a first translation and leave it there for a couple of months because mm. i need to detach from it so when you go back to it you have to have fresh eyes mm -hmm. so it's like you're doing a work you're revising a work done by somebody else you know mm -hmm. so in this way it's a bit schizophrenic as a as a, as a way to work but uh, it's probably you know, it's probably good because if you, if, if you work for many, many months on the same book, then you start getting the feeling that the book is yours mm -hmm. and it, that you can do whatever you want to the book. But you have to remember as a translator that you are translated some, some other person's books with your own words. So right. the new words are yours for some time, but you, they have to be, you know, mm. related to the old words. So you, you have to refrain from, you know, 
feeling that you are a real author because you're not a real author. Right. You know, musicians do that a lot mm. when they are in a recording studio or uh, producers. They, if they have been recording the same song all day long, then they just either have to play something else or also have to take a break because yeah. you kind of lose the context yeah. somehow. Is it, is it not the same with, with beer? Sometimes, like, <laughs> you know, you, you drink a couple of beers and then you need a whiskey because, I mean, it right. can really... You You're know, going to test that theory to... later on, by the way. Yeah. So. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure too. Like, they expect you probably to respect the deadline or is it more like they go yeah. and give you the job and be like okay whenever you're done uh, both things it depends on the cases like for instance when I did you it's just that it had to be out uh, on, an ex on a specific day mm -hmm. because the the book was going to be public domain uh, in January 2012 mm -hmm. which means that after that anybody can translate use for free Whereas before you had to pay the, the James Joyce estate. Right. So the book had to be out uh, after this deadline. And he couldn't do it too too late after that because other people might actually translate the same book. So you, the publisher wanted to be the first to, to do this. Is there a competition of people who want to translate books yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the same. The, 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 we ha in Italy, we have four translations of Ulysses, one coming. Wow. Mm. And maybe add even others that haven't been published. Mm. Finnegan's Wake, same thing. You know, there's a lot of people translating books. Of course, the only ones that actually get sold are the ones done, you know, with serious publishers. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, a lot of crypto translators around. Um, so, but yes, when I when I finished Ulysses, it was I had to hand it in by September, and this was the same the same month when my uh, daughter was going to be born. So basically, I ended in Ulysses on the 23rd of September, and she was born the day after. Mm. And when, when the book came out, three months after, she was three months, and, and they weighed the same. You know, the book Ulysses and my daughter <laughs> wow. weighed like a kilo or something. You know? So I sometimes kind of... Uh, you gave birth to two... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two children. Yeah, no, so deadlines are it's, it's important. Sometimes mm. you... Like I did a book a couple of years ago, a great book actually. I translated this book by a, a guy called... Um, remember the name anyway it's an american book called this the, the, the great wisdom of the earth mm -hmm. um and the book was bought by the publisher i was i was contracted i did translation i got i was paid but the book is not out yet mm -hmm. because they are probably waiting for the right occasion because it's a book on a specific thing right on mine disaster stuff like that mm -hmm. so maybe maybe the publisher is waiting for a fucking mine disaster to to have it out but uh, so sometimes you have these deadlines but they are they are futile they're not real deadlines mm -hmm. but you always have deadlines yeah how much time passes before you actually write down the first line of translation because i'm sure you first read the book then I'm sure you sometimes have to also research then maybe the slang of the era or like mm -hmm. so many things that probably need to be researched. Yeah. Like, uh, how long does it take? Uh, it takes and what, what do you have to research actually? Like, what, what do you look for? Like, because, you know, if, if something's mm -hmm. written in the 16th century, mm -hmm. people definitely spoke different than mm -hmm. they do today. Yeah. And maybe in their certain region, they also have a different accent. And how do yeah. you find out about these things? Yeah, first of all, you have to, I mean, I, my, my rule is uh, to do things that I kind of know. Like I would never okay. translate, say, an Australian book written in the slang of Australian kids now because okay. I don't because I would have to study a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. before. Whereas what I do is mainly, as I said, Irish literature, or mm -hmm. Scottish literature, and I and and um, slang, American slang literature. Okay. So, like in the case of this book that I was mentioning, mm -hmm. the big problem for me was the uh, was baseball's uh, jargon or uh, American football's jar mm -hmm. football jargon or weapons jargon because right. there was a lot of this. And what you have to, yeah, that's very difficult because sometimes uh, you don't even know how to translate. You, you might understand what a, a softball is, right? Mm. But uh, you, you can't, you, you can't translate it and you don't know if in baseball in Italy they actually use the same English words, you know? Right. So you have to do a lot of research, ask around, ask people that know better. Mm -hmm. um, so normally what I do is I read the old book and then I start uh, as soon as possible. And when I have problems, uh, the first thing is I try and and uh, and uh, identify uh, some friend or some guy that I know that might know about mm -hmm. this, rather than doing the research. Cause it's much easier, right. you know. Like you need to know about baseball. If you have a friend that plays baseball, it's it's much easier to consult him than a dictionary. Sure. Yeah? So that's what you do mainly. And uh, and then um and then you you know you go on. It's it's every book is specific. It's got specific problems. You, mm. you can't generalize too much. Like with Ulysses. 
every page has thousands of problems. <laughs> some imagine, words yeah. are not to be found in dictionary, and some oh. words are not even known by by the people there or by mm. scholars. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of words that that haven't been explained. Did you ever hit a dead end? Um? Did you ever hit a dead end? Uh, yeah, yeah. I remember, um, yes, I remember this thing. You know, you know the word ham, right? Raham. Right. Ham can be the, the 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 pig, okay, the pork, or the son of Noah, ham. Mm. Right? And in Ulysses, you have this word that plays that goes in two directions, and we don't have this. We don't have one single word that translates the two things in Italian. You know? right. We have either prosciutto got or cam. Mm. We don't have one word. So, whatever you do with translation, it's going, you're going to change the text a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I were I, I slaved with this. I mean, for for months I couldn't find any solution. Then I think I got very, very drunk one night, <laughs> and I found a solution, which is not really a solution. I mean, it is a translation, but it's not the exact translation. Like, it's an invented word in Italian. Mm. But I play with the word, uh, I translated this ham with the word insacco, which which refers to Isaac, which is Isaac's the son of Abraham, and insaccato, which is cure meat. You know, so, so, right. so I did that. It's not a translation, it's a, it's a rendition, but it's something that would... This please both Bible scholars and pork butchers, you know, because <laughs> because you're not uh, you're not doing the same thing. But mm. but when you translate, you're never doing the same thing. You're just changing the, the text, changing the words. Right. Yeah. Some so some things are more difficult than others. A dead end, mm, ultimate dead end, no. But uh, things that are, that take like months to be solved, yes, mm. many many times. And how do you keep yourself focused in all through all this? Like, I mean. Basically, you're sitting, are you writing on a laptop, I suppose, or yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, hours and hours of focusing. Like, do you take breaks? Like, do you have fixed breaks to, yeah, to yeah. kind of not go crazy? Or yeah, I mean, th- what I do is normally I, I don't work on one one single project. I work on like six or seven projects at the same time, what? which means I do like uh, half an hour on this, half an hour on this. Okay, and it helps. It helps break okay. the um, the ten- tension, but also. <laughs> It's kind of a gym for your mind, you know. When you mm-hmm. like at the moment, I'm translating. I'm, I'm still I'm redoing Ulysses for new edition, and I'm doing Oscar Wilde, and I'm doing Bobby Sands. Translated the, the play, the, the, the poems of Bobby Sands. I'm translating Orwell, like five or wow. six projects, right? So what I do is like half, half an hour or an hour huh. each. Like I translate a poem by Bobby Sands, and then soon after I'm, I'm, I start doing Dorian Gray, you mm-hmm. know. And this thing really helps your mind, you know, because. What we, because it teaches that we are, we are relative beings. We're not. You know, I'm. I'm not Oscar Wilde. I'm not Bobby Sands. I'm not Joyce. Right. You know, I I lend my voice to m- many of them, mm-hmm. and it, so you need to be detached at the same time. You need to be very very into a job, but also very detached. And to do many things at once helps. This is my. But a lot of translators don't do this. No, a lot of people just do the the, the one book for one three months. For, yeah. So okay. It's kind of, no, no. What do you think? What is best? Like when you play music, I think if you stare too many, too long at the same project, the same yeah. uh, thing, you kind of dull. Your, your mind becomes dull. Yeah. Like you, I think your performance suffers. Yeah, it's like having the same woman, you know, <laughs> for a long time. You know? <laughs> hey, love. <laughs> um, right. Or drinking the same beer all the, 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 yeah, the whole time. Yeah, you know, what what a life would that be? Yeah. You know, you know, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gonna get me in You're trouble You're a very spiritual here. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You like spirits, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just can um, already. I the... This was vodka. <laughs> it's actually water. I'm sorry about that. We don't have those kind of props, but I promise we will have something later on. No, it's just uh, just the fact because it takes a lot of it takes a lot of discipline, right? Mm. I mean, maybe that's why we, why uh, we like booze because it's kind of also a a balance. Real drinkers are, are workers, you know. They they are alcohol right. workers. Mm. They work, they work for for good cause. Right. And it's it's not easy. I mean, it's not. I, I admire a lot my friends in 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 Dublin that can drink thirteen pints, mm. you know, because it's not easy. I mean, I did it once with our common friend Paul when yeah. we went to Dublin. I, know, I had, well, I had I thirteen thought. pints and a few shots. Yeah. It's all your fault. And uh, no, it's a uh, it's po- well, it's possible. Mm-hmm. It is, but, but then, it's not easy at all. I mean. No. You need training. You need discipline. You have to work you know? up to it. Yeah, so it's it's the same thing. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, personally, I like to um, t- take periods. I'm not sure about yourself that I take off the booze for a long time. Mm-hmm. Like last year, I did one year without the alcohol, mm-hmm. and okay. I must say that constant, <laughs> but the concentration actually increases. Really? Oh yeah, and yeah. I started remembering things that I had forgotten in a long time. Yeah, I mean, last year I took a, a day without alcohol. Okay, <laughs> it was, congratulations. I was very concentrated that day. 
No. But yeah. this is a f- funny thing that sometimes we need this kind of thing to rewind in a way. Yeah. Um, because I, I think very often most of us we work in high, very high tension jobs mm. or, uh, you know, uh, we need kind of relief. I'm not sure if alcohol is the best form of relief. I will not endorse alcohol I mean, now, but. I guess alcohol works. It's an easy, work it's an more. easy relief, you know? Yeah, it is. But it, it's also like strange, like, because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a translator, but also a professor. Right. I cannot really drink before going to class. You no, know? Well, not, 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 you could, not, but you shouldn't probably. No, it's, there's, there's a lot of people that do it. Really? Uh, I don't find it, um, it's not good because it, uh, like when you have like two hours to teach a book, um, you can rumble around too much, you know? right. Like you can say things that are, that might appear disconnected, but you're not, you, you have to tell the basics. Like you have to at least give a picture, a solid picture of something. So that doesn't, that wouldn't help, you know? Right. Same thing actors. I was with the, this actor that, that, that performed, uh, Spoon River, the mm-hmm. translation of mine, uh, a few months ago. And he was telling me that, uh, he can never, he can never really drink before, before going on stage. Mm. One, because of the memory, you know, he might actually forget things. Mm-hmm. Two, because he might actually, he might overact, you know, he might overact, over identify. Right. right. And it's a problem. Because, I mean, a great actor is, uh, is the guy that can then identify with it, with the character, but also give us a sense of detachment, you know, a sense of strangeness, mm-hmm. aloofness in many ways, you know. It makes sense though, because if you drink or if you take drugs, you kind of disconnect a part of yourself with your body or you take give away control mm. <clears throat> and so if you have if you are an actor you have to have complete control of, about every aspect of your physique of your psychology yeah especially because you're dealing with with people much younger than you mm-hmm. in class and you never know what they what they think i mean you never you never know what how their brains function with their brains the, the, the speed at which they function i mean right so and then it's a lot of people it's not one to one you know it's mm-hmm. like you are talking in front of 35 40 people and they have lives, they have their own, you know, frailties. Right. So you need to take care of them in many ways. You can't really. Oh, yeah. Also, in the age of social media, besides all that, as a professor, if they tape you once drunk, you're out of the window. You don't. Yeah, yeah, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you have to think about that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. So what's it like uh, studying literature in uh, in Italy in these days? Is it uh, different than it was back then? It is. It is. Because culture is no, no more considered important at all I mean, by politicians. Mm-hmm. A lot of our politicians are, they aren't, they aren't book readers. They don't, they don't listen to music. I mean, they're just. Often it's a fault if they read books. Like, it's not cool, you know? It's yeah, yeah. If, when I was young, the, the, you, if you read, uh, you were considered, you know, a good person. Right. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of skepticism mm-hmm. for, for so called intellectuals, but also for anybody who's not uh, as, uh, uh, as stupid as normal politician right. is nowadays. So, yeah, it is difficult. It's the elite. Yeah. The evil elite. Yeah, the evil <clears throat> elite, ignorant elite, I guess. Mm. But the problem now is the, 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 also the uselessness of it, because a lot of our students of literature, they either have to go away, go abroad and mm. study abroad, or in this country, they, they will have to wait so many years before becoming high school teacher professors. Um, many, many years, uh, very little paid jobs. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, this sense of uselessness is felt now. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't felt back then. Back then, if you were good, you, you had a chance. Now you have to be incredibly good, incredibly lucky, mm. you know. It's connected in particular to literature or uh, is it the, the humanities generally? in general? I okay. mean, I guess philosophy is even worse at the, the moment. I mean, mm-hmm. a philosopher is... A lot of philosophers don't tell her around that their philosophers really? are uh, going to do things that are not connected to what they mm. to what they study for. Um, whereas what I studied became my job, you know. Right. It's, this situation is, is really rare nowadays. So are also less students uh, signing up or do you I see any change? I would say much, much less. I mean, yes, the numbers are increasing in general in Italy, apart mm. from the north. Numbers of students that enroll at the university. Okay. Because figures say that uh, uh, you have more chances to get a job if you don't have a, a degree than if you have a degree. It's very strange. Okay. This country is not investing in, in culture. It's not investing. Maybe like blue collar jobs, you know, like uh, yeah. stuff that is more physical. Yeah. I mean, it's great jobs. They're right. Great jobs. I mean, I, I did when I was in Dublin doing my PhD, I worked as a night porter in a youth hostel. Mm-hmm. And it was possibly. The, the best job I ever did because <laughs> it was really great to be in right. contact with so many people at night. Mm-hmm. So I, re- I admire a lot those jobs. But uh, but the idea that you don't need to study anymore is frightening. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that this country is going down, especially because we we are supposed to be we're supposed to be the country of many many intellectuals and musicians and uh, and writers and philosophers. Right. And we kind of owe to our past to a bit of seriousness. Whereas I don't see this around. Mm-hmm. I don't see this in my colleagues. I don't see this in politicians. It's very strange. I do see it in students. I mean, students are much more aware okay. of this the the power of this cultural capital, this tradition that we have. But uh, so we have to help them. That's the only way. Right. But why do you think that is? Because uh, a lot of people I talk to blame it on, uh, well, it's always the government, obviously. Uh, many say there was a decline in culture under Berlusconi, like this all kind of strong element of political uh, fault. Uh, so it's, it's an explanation I hear a lot. Mm-hmm. But do you also think it has uh, there's different causes than that? or? No, I, I, I think that it, I mean, I couldn't say Berlusconi only. But Berlusconi is tip of the iceberg. It's not. Mm. I mean, nowadays he's irrelevant. He's, he's just an old man, a ghost. Uh, yeah, but uh, but twenty years ago he, he managed to change his country really, really fast. Uh, I spent most of the Berlusconi years in Ireland. So mm-hmm. what happened to me was I left a certain country, and then when I came back, the country was different. Right, incredibly different. Because of the power of television, because of the power of newspapers, mm-hmm. uh, of the media, and Berlusconi owned those things. He owned, he owned a lot of television, but also he was in charge of the of the national television because right, uh, he would put the president of the right was selected by. What's very particular about here was the duopoly of the television. So yeah. they only had two kind of channels: which one was media set and all the channels with it, mm-hmm. which were all Berlusconi owned, and yeah. then the Rai and the public. Yeah. Uh, which I think in the end you own too, right? Or a part of it, because uh, whoever is in government has kind of a saying in what's yeah, yeah, partially yeah, they, being they, played. They, yeah, I mean, the Rai became Berlusconized a lot right. in those years. Like now, they, nowadays, it's uh, totally Movimento Cinque Stelle and totally Salvini. Mm. So it's even worse than, than, it, than what it was with Berlusconi. At least Berlusconi could speak properly. <laughs> uh, so it's this is the problem. I mean, this country was uh, for, for, for too many years in a row uh, forgot the what is this? Earthquake? No, no, it's just the metro. The metro. Ah, the tram. Oh, Eight. the tram. Yeah, the A tram. So no, yeah, the, we forgot the importance of culture. It's it's uh, it's it's very sad. Mm. So I don't blame my 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 students when they decide to go abroad. I would go abroad myself. Mm-hmm. I'm actually leaving for America very soon to teach for a semester. Wow. And um, yeah, because this country deserves to reach the bottom line. You know. Only then it can raise its head. Right. Do you think it's going to get much worse than it is now? It could. It could always rain, you know. <laughs> it could rain. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't see many hopes because the left is, is dead. Mm. And the left would be the only hope. In, a, right. in, a, in any country where culture is important, the only the only hope is the left. Right. And when you when, when there is no left in a country, that means that, that you have to start from scratch. Mm-hmm. You know? You, like workers don't realize how how much they lose when they when they don't have any uh, left uh, re- reference in in the left. But but the left is no not there, you know. In the sense that they have, are powerless, or do you think they have changed uh, they, what they they, s- what they were really Berlusconized themselves too? You know, they okay. became very f- they're very far away from the working classes. Right, they're very far away from the masses. Uh, they don't really know what they want. Uh, they're against the capital capitalism, but at the same time in favor, uh, and they don't realize that you have to start. If you want to be credible as a left politician, you have to start from from the weakest, from the from the poor, mm-hmm. not from not from me, not from professors. You know, you have to start from the workers, from the unemployed, from right. women, from the immigrants. Whereas the left has forgotten this. I mean, when I say the left, I mean the big party of the left, right? Because there is the left in Italy, but it's it's totally irrelevant because they don't have access to to the media. They um, most of them uh, talk to themselves, really, you know. Okay. They do their best, but uh, it's very sad. Because I mean, I, I'm, I'm my name. I was given the name Enrico because of Enrico Berlinguer. Enrico Berlinguer was right. the secretary of the Communist Party in this mm-hmm. country at a time when the Communist Party reached thirty five percent in the, in the polls. So, and this guy was really strong and he was incredibly, uh, he had an incredibly high moral stand. Um, and then he died. Mm. And after him, the left has been lost, uh, I think. One thing that's interesting is uh, in the United States in particular, they say at the universities, uh, most, uh, most, um, 
what do you call it, most disciplines are actually very left leaning. Do you see the same thing in Italy? Mm. And if it's the case, how comes that uh, they start left and then what happens then after university? Why, why does it disappear all of a sudden when, when people go out into society? Yeah, it's very strange. I always mm. ask myself this question. Because especially in humanities, I suppose, yeah, most people are very, very left leaning. Very few right? people can, can call themselves right, you know, mm. right wing. I mean, up till a few years ago, it was, I mean, nobody, I mean, to be a right wing intellectual would be an oxymoron, you know, there's mm. no right wing intellectuals. So right wing really meant in the university stupid, you know. Okay. Now it's no more because, I mean, nowadays the right is very strong and a lot mm. of intellectuals are actually outspokenly <laughs> from the right. Mm. So we don't have that. But yes, we have the wide majority of the people in the humanities that call themselves left. Okay. But it doesn't mean that they are. You know, because so they just say because they're afraid of losing their jobs or whatever. Yeah, they they're afraid of being taken for you know, uh, I don't know, downgraded to, to yeah, the stupid guy. To stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I mean, mm, of course, if you when if you if, if anybody tries to study the philosophy of fascism, you realize on the spot that it's a, a lot of crap. You know, a mm. lot of very, very stupid ideas and banal and incredibly sketchy. But that doesn't mean that they are not believable and they, they're right. not felt to be good, you know, mm -hmm. because a lot of people believe in those things. So we intellectuals should really uh, help people open their eyes rather mm -hmm. than, you know, telling them how, how, they, how stupid you are. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what the left did right. for for the past three three decades, you know, mm. the left just told the other people, ah, yes, we are the ones, they understand, you are stupid, so just, just follow us. But sometimes people stop following you, you know? Right. Just to understand the the, the meaning of the words as well, or to define what is in Italy, the right considered different than, for example, in the States, because right and left can just be conservative mm. and liberal, for mm. example, or liberal could be even mm. both sides as well. Uh, mm. Is Italy, like in Italy, is the right wing con automatically considered to be uh, the right fringe, like fascists? Because you know, a conservative person like living in Abruzzo, being mm -hmm. uh, living uh, in a in a village, I mean, they're mostly conservative people. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily uh, yeah, no, they're not, not automatically. It's not the same thing as fascists. I think yeah, it's yeah. a problem in the United States that right wing people actually very often found this caricature mm -hmm. very insulting that mm -hmm. they were uh, conservatives and they were called uh, you know your uh, uh, right wing uh, Nazi whatever yeah, and so they that's yeah. this what by many they say actually voted Trump yeah to, uh, to give you the finger back to the left side in yeah the United I think States. The, the, the balance is different here is it different here it used to be I mean you, historically speaking of course right. the left would be the communists and then you had the Christian Democrats who was half partly left partly right like center -ish. yeah so you would have like the progressive Christian progressives and Christian uh, moderates, so the okay. kind of reaction. And then the real right was the the, the former fascists. Now the, the right is in a, a big uh, ocean of different ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that, let's say, Berlusconi's right is the, the liberal capitalist right. Uh, uh, Salvini's right is the neo-Nazi uh, okay. right nowadays. nowadays. But people just don't... I don't think that people realize how dangerous it is to be in the hands of people that don't they don't have a, a perspective mm -hmm. for the past, but just a love for uh, for the future, but just a love for the past. Right. Because this is what this is what they are. I mean, they just go, uh, they forget history. People. I'm not talking about the people that vote for Salvini, but mm -hmm. uh, himself and the, and the, right. and the, the bunch of people that uh, that are with him. They don't have any notion of history, mm. of what happened to us Italians up till 30 years ago. Okay. And if they knew, they would not be able to, to, to go about with all this crap. Mm. So you think he's a, you think he's a fascist actually? Or? Yeah, I think he's a fascist. But because fascist I, I don't know it well, because I was, uh, just to give a bit of context, I was raised abroad. Right. I just right. came to Rome maybe 10 years ago or something. Right. So. I didn't see much of Italian politics. Why do you, why do you go to Rome? <laughs> Everybody's asking the same question. The uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got to create some uh, interesting things myself, you know, like the podcast yeah. here. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're Little bubbles job. where I can uh, exist, coexist. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, do you think... I think so, yeah. That he is, yeah. I think so. I mean, who's a fascist? The fascist is the guy that doesn't take care at all about the weak, the, the weakest, mm. you know? Like, look at what is happening in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. Right. To, to Salvini, the fact that so many uh, children and, and mothers die in the sea mm. doesn't count. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't even shed a tear about them. Mm. 
And I'm pretty sure that this is this is what a fascist is. A fascist is a guy who is not a, a doesn't have any empathy for the other. For humans. Yeah. Oh. And uh yeah, that that equals really stupidity, right? Mm. But that's a problem. We shouldn't say it. It's a it's very sad. Look at what up, what's happening here in Rome with this Casa Pound movement. You know, mm-hmm. they they don't these people. They they never read Pound. I mean, Pound was a great poet. Mm-hmm. He of course was a fascist. Mm-hmm. He had said very bad things. Mm-hmm. But he but to 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 use Pound uh, as a, as the the flag of this new new fascist movement is mm-hmm. ridiculous. The all the family of Pound has said uh, that they don't have anything to do with this with these people, right? And that uh, Pound himself in the fifties and sixties uh, realized that he was that he had been very very wrong in saying mm. th- some some things, but he was also a bit crazy. Okay. So now nowadays these people use the name of Pound without any any awareness, mm. any awareness of of what Pound was. So this tells you the level of ignorance in this country, right? So I was I was walking in Bologna very. A few months ago, there was this great graffiti that I liked a lot, and he read the più case meno pound, yeah? <laughs> more houses, less pound. It's right. pretty good. Yeah. So, what do you, what, where do you think this whole thing is heading? Uh, where do you think Italy is going? Do you think they will go down the the dump for the a while toilet. and then come Flush. down the toilet exactly? I don't know. Before because they come back, it's, a, it's such a beautiful country. Because it's it's a contradictive, it's a big contradiction too. Because it's still the sixth biggest economy, I think, in the world, or ninth maybe now, but still. It's, it's in big, the top. Yeah. It's a lot of money make it being made still in the north of Italy, especially, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. Um, it is technically a wealthy economy. Mm-hmm. The problem we have is a, is a debt mm-hmm. from the past, which is being repaid and mm-hmm. the interest rates. Mm-hmm. But standing by itself, it's nowhere near a risk like Greece for, you know. No, no, so, from no. an economical point of view, uh, well, many people are still suffering. Mm-hmm. Too many are suffering, and the youth uh, is very unemployed still, and mm-hmm. many people are leaving. So I don't. I, I think that for sure this country is not too. Um, um, it's 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 really difficult to say what what will happen because Italy is is a great country. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful country. It will always attract people, even right. Rome. And Rome is full of garbage, but uh, people come all the same, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and Italians are still a nice a nice people, mm-hmm. but. As, as you were saying before, you said Italy is very, still a re- very rich country. The father of James Joyce was a was a pretty wealthy guy mm-hmm. when Joyce was young, and he became became bankrupt in a couple of decades. You know, okay. like if you make the wrong choices for for some time uh, in a row, then you can be at risk. And I think that oh, yeah. this all this discussion of all this debate uh, from Salvini and the rest of them. Uh, is about against the euro, okay? The euro mm. currency. The euro right. currency uh, really saved this country. I mean, mm. economists, but also you know anybody with a little brains, know that without the euro, we would have been left out from 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 the world. Then we mismanaged the the, the changeover. Mm. So after the euro came in, there was no control of the prices, okay, over rents. Uh, so basically, we're now paying double what we used to pay you know, before, you know, at the end of the ninth, because it was mismanaged. Mm. Germany was almost in recession before the euro, and they became what they are now, right. twenty years. So I guess that uh, if you make many mistakes in a row, then uh, even a great, you know, solid situation can turn very, very bad, and your condition can turn very sour easily. Mm. So I'm not too confident that we have chances. But I think that Italy has always been like this in a way, you know. Like, think of Rome. Rome is dirty. Rome is incredibly decaying. Uh, it's totally it's been mismanaged for right. 20 years. But Rome, in the in the imaginary of the Western world, has always been decaying. Okay, it's always mm. been like really fatty scent. Uh, you don't see imperial imperial Rome was a, just a dream of the fascists. Okay, mm. the fact that Rome was law and order. Rome has always been like this. So, so it's been for over 3,000 years, except for the period of Augustus, maybe, yeah, who has been yeah. uh, kind of managing <laughs> yeah. it properly. Yeah, it's one of those misreadings, you know, the, of them. But, uh, so I think that Italy will survive. But the thing is, will the Italian spirit survive? I mean, because mm. they, uh, a lot of young kids are going away and they are the best minds. They're going away right. by, by the thousands. And, uh, we're losing a lot of people. And mm. when you lose a lot of people, there could be the fundamentals for for your future. Then your future is at risk. Your future is mm. in the hands of this this 
people, you know, that don't don't really know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So I'm very pessimistic. Okay, I can I can tell. But but in your mind, what what does uh, then it mean the Italian spirit? What is the Italian spirit in your mind? Because very often, in a way, you could also think that people leaving here they kind of distribute the Italian spirit and spread it in the world. Mm. Of course, it dilutes then, and uh, mm. but it just loses its confines of Italy. It just spreads out and mm. can, then gets planted somewhere else. Yeah, when I say Italian spirit, I meant mainly the tradition of hospitality and friendliness. Mm-hmm. And the idea that uh, that many many years ago, you anybody would be welcome. I mean, there are popular songs in Rome, Rome popular songs that say in the sixties and seventies, whoever comes to Rome becomes a Roman. Mm. Nowadays, whoever comes to Rome is a foreigner and stays a foreigner. You know, uh, so this is the, the, this type of tradition that we exported. Okay, we exported a lot of things. We exported the mafia too mm. in America, but uh, the Italians were always seen to be people who are very reasonable people very people that would help the other okay mm-hmm. nowadays we're losing this and it's a, it's a pity not just because we are losing in, in our standing but also because uh, we to, to not to make the other people feel at home when they are in your in your home is a it's a pity you know it's a it's a it's a real scandal actually it's All not right. pity you know like when It doesn't take a communist to say this. It's a it's a it's a religious thought. It's a philosophical thought. You your house is my house, mm-hmm. and we're losing this. Right. I mean, yeah. There's many problems. I mean, I, in a way, I can understand how people get upset. Like if you live on Lampedusa, for example, mm. and you see thousands of people coming in every week. I mean, if I put myself into their shoes, I can understand that <clears throat> they start getting a bit pissed off about it. Mm. So they're being left alone with it, mm. and, and uh, very. I think Italy has also been left alone with the whole problem. That's and I think there's two different things. Like one is, I think I, I agree that we have to save every single soul we can, mm. no matter what. And the second one is there must be some management behind it. As I said, also with the euro, it was an opportunity, but it has been mismanaged. Mm. Like the immigrants, in a way, will save them, but then it cannot turn to an opportunity. But it needs proper management yeah. because it needs proper management. I think both for integration for mm-hmm. for uh, the sake of the people who live there and the people who come here because if it's managed properly hey it's all great we can all coexist you know of course but this is like what is happening in germany yeah. what is happening in spain like you have to in agree like, with different cultures we have bigger numbers of immigrants than us right i mean our immig- oh yeah way bigger yeah, yeah. i mean our, our figures of our immigrations are very very small compared to germany or france mm. and they do implement uh, policies i mean they realize sometimes cynically That the, the immigrants actually not just work workforce, but also the possible future of your of your nations. Right. Look at England or or America. You know what mm. what would they be without immigration? So yes, we've been left alone in terms. Uh, well, we probably deserve to be left alone because we mean we've <laughs> been so. insulting <laughs> all of them for the past two years. You know, it's uh, I don't know. I, I I I don't see the, the I mean I see countries have to have borders and frontiers and whatever, mm. but they are supposed to be for the good, you know, not for the bad right. of, of the country first. Mm-hmm. You know? And we are treating our borders in the way that uh, that will uh, damage, will make a lot of damage in the future. Mm. We are totally isolated in Europe, possibly in the world. You know, this is just because we love our borders so much. You know. Mm. Do you think do you have any hope that uh, the young generation is going to turn this around? I mean, it's up to you, man. You, you, <laughs> you should answer this. Do you have hopes? Oh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very optimistic right. person generally. Yeah. If you look at the statistics, the wealth factor is and the health factor is pretty high historically speaking in Italy all over the world. So I, I think also I'm not sure if you ever read Stephen Pinker, like about uh, the statistics over in the history of humanity, like. We might have maybe maybe a little bump, but generally things are improving all over the world. Like even the poorest countries in the world, like China, also now they are you know booming. Mm. Uh, regions in India are starting to boom, and so people are being lifted out of absolute poverty everywhere in the world. The whole fact that we are so interconnected, and that now I can speak with somebody who lives uh, in New Jersey in real time and do projects uh, with somebody, then a third person in Japan in real time. You know, all these things are potentials that have not been there before. Mm. I think many people who call themselves fascists today, for example, they don't even understand what fascism really means. Mm. And it's dangerous, but I think there's a chance to also get them back on track. Mm. 
I don't think they're somebody who calls themselves fascist and maybe just a stupid, stupid person at that moment. But mm. I think they deserve a chance to be pulled back inside into normal society. Mm. I think the only thing that can help is to, to, for everybody to talk more with each mm. other. That's why I like to do the podcast. You know, maybe uh, one day I'm going to start a format where I have people on with different you know, opinions. Fascist, fascist. <laughs> Let's invite some fascists. That's not what I mean. But you know, I, I, <laughs> no. But uh, besides that, I think communication is is key here. Mm-hmm. Communication and like, for example, what I see is not working in the United States, especially with Trump. For example, mm-hmm. one thing I see is not working. It's just yelling or mm-hmm. protesting or denouncing every single fart mm. that one side is making because that just makes people more mad. I think Trump's going to be reelected, for example. I think they're so pissed off <sighs> by by virtue signaling and by mm. oversensitivity. I'm, I'm quite convinced that he's going to win again. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I, of, of course, I hope not, but I don't, I don't think that... I mean, I, I think that Americans are in, in some way opening their eyes because I mean, I think Trump many people just... dislike him. I think many people on the right also dislike the way he uh, yeah. does things, but I they mean, like his policy. Mm. They like his politic. They like his. Uh, yeah, the last last thing that he, he, the last insults to, to the black women in parliament. So he's attacking so many people. Oh yeah, he's uh, he's horrible in that regard. Mm. De- definitely. I mean, last time I think that women also had a role in in electing Trump, but I think that this time, I mean, a lot of women would be just totally against mm. you know supporting this this guy. Um, I don't know. I think that the, the, the Bernie Sanders is doing a, a great job. Mm. Um, he's not. I mean, although he is old, but he's not as old as as they depict mm. him because he's very young inside. And I think that he has the power to beat Trump if he ever gets elected. If because Ooh. the poll numbers are yeah, I know all the way down. I know. Like he was a uh, he, he had a big hype for years ago. I remember yeah. he came to Rome actually. I had some yeah. friends visiting him too and shaking hands and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like he, I think he had. Chances four years ago mm, or even, five, but Warren, Casio, I mean, there are a number of candidates that are <coughs> pretty good. Joe, um, Pete Buttigieg, so, I, I met uh, mm. last time I went to America. Really? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are, there's a lot of potential there. Mm. And I think that the Americans are not going to go for Trump again. I mean, mm. but this is my hope. Now I'm being optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I see more more pessimistic about that. <laughs> but yeah. So, Perugia, the humanities. Do you get a um, lot of exchange students too there? Yeah, because I, I teach in the Università di Stranieri, which is University oh, okay. for Foreigners. Right. And it's, uh, yeah, 70% of our students are from uh, foreign countries. M- most of them are from China or from the Arab countries. But we also have a few Europeans, a few South Americans. So why does somebody still go into humanities then today? If if, if you say it's mm. like a dying field where job opportunities are not uh, be- being offered. Because, because for some reason... Uh, regardless of whatever whatever job you you do, you will do in the future. Uh, it's better if you do it with a, a cultural awareness. Right. So I think I mean our university is different because people come come to uh, to us to study Italian language and culture, mm-hmm. and to do international politics. So it's a very international mm-hmm. environment. Right. So it's not the the normal the standard university. But in general, I think that uh, the the fact that a lot of people are still enrolling in faculty of letters and arts. Mm. Is because we we secretly know that it it is you, you are a better person if you if you are culturally aware, right? Right. And uh, so I think that this is this will will not uh, fade too easily because Italian culture was based. I mean, since elementary school, we are we are given we are talked about the importance of of our cultural tradition. Mm-hmm. So it stays with us. Most people uh, that I know. Uh, even from different cultural backgrounds, have got good libraries at home, you know, right. buy books for the kids. So we still have that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet we, we hope that things will change. And I'm pretty sure that if things will change, they will not change because of economists or political scientists. They will change because of po- the poets, mm-hmm. because of the musicians, because of the creative people. Because this is the only way. The only way out is to to use our only real faculty, which is creativity, imagination. Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't have much imagination in, in, in non-humanities sectors nowadays. Right. So I do, I do hope that this, is, uh, that this can lead somewhere. Mm. So how do how you feel uh, Ireland is right now as compared to back then when you visited last time? Uh, it's a different place. It's a, it's a different, different place. Like when I, the, the first time I, I landed in Dublin Airport, mm-hmm. uh, the Dublin Airport had, I think, five gates. 
Okay. One terminal and five gates. Now it's like two big terminals and thousands, uh, real a lot a lot of different gates. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dublin itself was was small. I wouldn't say provincial, but it was incredibly small. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I mean, Google has the headquarters in Dublin, Facebook. Right. So, and they, those big multinationals are in a place they used to be pretty dodgy back then. I mean, the docks, the docks area. Mm-hmm. Now it's all glass buildings, glass cages, and uh, a lot of oh, white collars and a lot of rich people there. You know, mm-hmm. houses cost a lot of money. So I think that Ireland is changing because of, of the economy. And it's also changing because, um, for some, for, for the first time in history, especially with this Brexit uh, story here, uh, Ireland is the only European country where English is spoken. So it's, it's actually the, the right. English was the first language. So right. it's actually the first choice for Americans, but also for, for many other countries, you know, whereas the first choice before would have been England. Mm-hmm. So Ireland is investing in this and, uh, and the country's changed. And when I, what I was saying before about the Italian spirit being, disappearing actually right i don't think that this is happening in ireland despite of the of the richness and the wealth and the fact that they are very rich mm-hmm. you, you still have that kind of thing you still have the irish spirit mm-hmm. so i don't know i can't, ex- can't explain this but for sure mm-hmm. the, the the same friendliness that i encountered when i was your age 16 17 mm-hmm. whatever thanks <laughs> <laughs> in ireland is still there i still find it mm-hmm. whereas i don't find this in my country mm-hmm. I find this very strong Irish culture in Rome. Like, the, weirdly enough, I kind of got catapulted into it mm, right mm. The, from the moment I mm. I arrived in Rome, and uh, <clears throat> I started around this very famous Irish pub that I uh, got dragged into by our common friend Paul. And uh, I'm not sure um, historically how that comes. That you know that there's this strong community. There's a lot of very interesting people here from Ireland, from different parts of Ireland, many from Dublin. Um, very active community. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like from your point of view, do you know why why it is? I don't know why. I mean, I know that. I mean, sorry, it's pretty big. You know, the pretty big Irish big community now. here. I mean, now it's. I mean, it, it, it's it's always been big. But Maybe do you know has something to do with it? Maybe the fact that the first Irish pub in Italy yeah, started. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, the the, the fact that Gino's pub and Gino's mm-hmm. pubs actually, right? Um, they, they they really helped this, but I, the bond was always there because I mean the Irish College in Rome is an very it's an right. ancient institution, and uh, there's always been a very very close link between Ireland and Italy mm. via Catholicism, but also mm, a net of uh, of contacts in in the years. Right nowadays, I mean there was a time in the I guess the eighties and the nineties where Ireland was really fashionable here, mm-hmm. uh, fashionable in terms of. Uh, uh, of the music, of course, the beer, of course, the, the fact that it was cheaper than England then, you know, like right. if you had, if you had to choose where to go for your, for your uh, English learning holidays in in the summer, mm-hmm. you know, Ireland was like really, really cheap, and you would have the chance to meet with the people and become friends with people very easily. Mm-hmm. Whereas in England, you would pay the double and find those, you know, uh, sometimes too uh, cold. Uh, uh, People who are too cold, you know, the reception in England wouldn't be wouldn't be like like in Ireland. Mm. But then, and then in Italy, uh, Irish writers were translated a lot. They still are, but like in the nineties, everything from Ireland would be translated and read and reviewed. So there was some kind of love for Ireland, right. and I think it still stays. Mm-hmm. But now it's probably because of the pubs, <clears throat> because you know, if you go to an Irish, a real Irish pubs, not. A Guinness franchise. Right. If you go to a real Irish pub, you still have a chance to to find to have a, a nice night, you know, mm-hmm. and meeting people with uh, that you didn't know before and becoming mm-hmm. friends very easily with, with people. Mm-hmm. So this thing happens, but it also happens in Roman bars. I mean, I'm my bar is San Calisto. I don't know if you ever go there. Yeah, it's in Trastevere, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's. Uh, I used to go there a lot when yeah. I was. It was 16, 14. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, they, they're, they're turning 50 on the 4th of August. So it's I still open part. because I saw that there was like a, a demonstration or something happening a few weeks ago, maybe mm-hmm. a flash mob, and they staged like kind of a funeral in front of it. Not a real one, of course, yeah. but <laughs> I thought that they had closed down and they were protesting. Uh, no, they, it was closed last year for three three or four days. Mm. But it was just, maybe I people mean, protesting the three, four days closure yeah. or something. No, no, they're turning 50 
on the fourth. Because they still have like the uh, original popular prices for the drinks and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's the only place probably or one of the few ones that has arrived. Yeah. Coffee still lady, I think, eighty cents. What? The, the, the ice creams, like you can buy an ice cream for one euro, one made by them. It's great. Wow. No, yeah. no, it's a great place, and the vibe is good. You know, yeah. it's really easy Laid to back. make friends with people. Mm. Very international. Very Roman in the morning, and very international in the afternoon. Okay. Mm. So yeah, I noticed that uh, we went. I was in Sicily uh, not long last week, I think, with my band, and uh, yeah, there was a uh, this lady running this Irish pub. Uh, or a couple and uh, there's a lot of Irish coming here to Italy yeah. uh, also for private events to get married yeah. or something you know it's yeah. there's, there's some connection there I haven't figured out what it is but there's yeah. some similarity maybe it's a hospitality that you mentioned before that you think is getting lost here could, could be maybe could that's be. could be the religion the religious factor right. could be many things mm. I mean historically speaking there was, there's always been many many contacts I mean our presidents are very f friends within them Trapattoni was there as an ambassador mm -hmm. not so long ago, you know, a football yeah, coach. Trapattoni, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trapattoni was there, yeah. Coach Chanti lives in Dublin, mm. you know, the thing. Right. Yeah. So you also publish stuff uh, on newspapers, I read. Yeah, yeah, I write so, for Manifest. Okay, so do you have a regular uh, gig there? Uh, almost regular. Like, I write, uh, I, uh, I cover Irish affairs, okay. political and also cultural things. Mm. So basically, for the supplement, for the literary supplement, I write reviews, okay. mainly of Irish books, or so, you know, Scottish books, mm. American books. Whereas for the paper itself, I write about Northern Ireland. So wherever, whenever there is something happening up there, uh, we, write, we cover it. And now right. with Brexit, um, I've been asked to write a lot because okay. Northern yeah. Ireland is really crucial in the, in the future ring of, of Great Britain. Right. Uh, was a woman right. killed recently, just a few yeah. now months ago, I think two months ago or so? Mm, yeah, journalist. Casual, journalist, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the first victim in a long time, right? I mean, no. Not? There are, there, there, there have been, I mean, the, the point with Northern Ireland is that nobody speaks about it anymore. But acts of violence are happen, happen on a daily basis. I know every year they have like this uh, demonstration where they put up a pile of, yeah. I'm not sure what it is, and they burn it, and it's supposed to be yeah. England or something. Like, they prov provoke each other still on a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the 11th, the 11th of July. Right. We we were there last year, myself and another journalist, wow. to cover this tribal um, Ritual. events. Rituals, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a terrifying. So a lot, there's a lot of violence, still a lot of violence. But also young people I saw on some... Uh, news reportage like how is it that young people still get uh, involved in this you know because there's a lot of unemployment there's i mean there's the feeling that uh, northern ireland has been left uh aside in the whole process of brexit right. because they, whatever they said even in the in the in the referendum didn't count i mean they didn't choose for mm. i mean 56 percent of what remain that means that also the protestants and the unionists voted for europe but this you know <laughs> was not taken into account at all so there is a, f a sense of frustration and the fact that they don't have a government they, the, they don't have a government not Northern Ireland government right since what since february 2017 so all decisions are taken from london uh, there's a lot of yeah a lot of frustration the problem is that uh, the the young are going uh, becoming more and more interested in the uh, in the uh, in rioting okay mm. in the uh, in the idea that some sort of armed struggle is uh, is an option, whereas for for the past it was considered not to be. Right. So I'm not again. I'm not too optimistic there because they see that there is a lot of uh, turmoil. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people are dissatisfied. So let's see what happens with Brexit. But if uh, if ever a hard border is implemented between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, I see it becoming the target of right. attacks mm. from both sides. So they have to manage this very well. I don't. I don't see that the the Tory people are paying much attention to this. You know, mm -hmm. they're treating Northern Ireland as just a colony. You know, which is it is a colony. Do mm. so you think they're going to have a hard Brexit? You think first of all, do you think Boris Johnson is going to be elected? <clears throat> I think so. Yeah, he will. He will. Um, hard Brexit. They are saying they want it, but there's a lot of people that don't, mm. and there's a lot of problems involved in the hard Brexit because the Scottish will will, uh, will not like it. People in Northern Ireland will not like it. 
a lot of people in the in the in conservatives don't like it. Mm-hmm. So I think that there will be some some kind, of, and then it's not good. I mean, economically speaking, it's uh, it's too great, too big a risk for for everybody, not mm-hmm. just for them or for Ireland, but also for for Europe. So it's very difficult to see how they can, you know, uh, they can get out well mm-hmm. uh, of this process without negotiating. Especially if you see that. It seems to be in the end always the economy that makes it creates a lot of violence because mm. apparently when people are employed they seem to have less time to do stupid mm-hmm. things. Mm. I mean it seems it seems to be a direct correlation, no? In a certain way. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so the unemployed that gets the bar, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. So anything optimistic about the future? Yes, the our our meeting at the bar. When is it? Like now? Yes, uh, <laughs> no, that's, uh, we have reached uh, one hour, I think, Mark. That's great. So great. Thank you very much for you. everything, man. Enrico. Is there anything, any website or anything uh, where people can read your stuff? Well, obviously the books uh, I mean, that you translated and your yeah, the uh, articles I mean, have, and the manifesto. We have a Twitter account. Uh, Myself and the other translator, we post a lot of funny stuff. Okay. Like, um, language games and stuff like that. Uh, what's, what's the Twitter handle? Uh, it's fin, Finn's Awake. Finn's okay, Finn's Awake. Yeah. I'll also post yeah, it in my uh, name. I know this description of all our video links and stuff so people can just cool. conveniently great. click on it. That's well, great. thank you so much for stopping by. I yes, appreciate sir. your time. Yes, it's great. Thanks uh, to everybody for listening and watching uh, the Hey Cell podcast. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks, Enrico. Now we have it. Now we're going to have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye.